Hey everyone, today I'm going to talk about Tony's Choco Lonely chocolate maker out of Netherlands. Um, you may, this may not be high class chocolate to you, but I'm talking about this because of their trying to impact the chocolate industry in general. So that's, I think it's important and that's why I'm going to talk about them today. So they are, I like their slogan. Their slogan is crazy about chocolate, serious about people. And their vision is for 100% worldwide slave free chocolate. Not just theirs, but all chocolate, the whole chocolate industry. And that's what impact they're trying to have. So a little background, how they got to be and where they're coming from. So in the early 2000s, the BBC aired a documentary on slavery. I think it was called Slavery in a Global Investigation. Um, one part of it reported on slavery in the chocolate industry. And that really got the attention of some people. Um, it led to worldwide interest in slavery in the chocolate industry, creating of NGOs indirectly to the creation of fair trade certification, and in the United States in 2001 to the creation of the Harkin Engel Protocol, which was an agreement between the government and the chocolate industry to try and eradicate the worst forms of slavery. So in 2002, Ton van, van de Koken, um, yeah, <laughs> Dutch names and words, I'm either going to skip them or have pronounced them completely incorrectly. So he was on a Dutch TV show, him along with two other journalists in the Netherlands, took a look at this Harkin Angle protocol, took a look at the chocolate industry and realized that none of their agreements were being upheld and that really nothing was happening to change the fact that slavery was built into the chocolate industry as part of their business model. And so Tien was completely um, just shocked that slavery still existed. So he decided to take it into his own hands. He went and talked to a Dutch law professor and he decided to prosecute himself as being complicit with slavery for buying and eating chocolate. So his thought was if he bought a chocolate bar knowing or being able to know that slaves were involved in the production, he was part of committing the offense. And so he recorded himself eating 17 chocolate bars, including famous names you would know like Ritter Sport and Milka and After Eight, Cote d'Or, Toblerone, M&M's, Smarties, Twix, Mars, all these bars that he recorded himself eating. He then took himself down to the police station, asked to be arrested and hired a lawyer to send him to jail. He wanted the lawyer to make the case against him. Uh, he's a TV journalist, so this is all filmed. <laughs> this is not him doing it by himself. He's being filmed while he's doing it. So he did it in this particular way because if he had charged the manufacturers of chocolate, then what would have happened is they would have sent an army of top lawyers down to attack him. He would have been broke in a week and they would have wiped the floor with him and the case would be gone forever. But since he denounced himself, if it came to a conviction against Tune, eating chocolate would become punishable, not just to him, but to all people who ate chocolate that involves slavery, which would condemn the whole industry. So that's why he chose to take that approach. So the first time they went up against the judge, the case was dismissed by the judge, um, I believe saying that it had no jurisdiction. So in order to make the case more solid against himself, um, he realized that he needed to get former slaves to testify against him to prove the case. So they went to Burkina Faso, which is a country just a little bit north, 
the east-ish of Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast and Ghana are the two countries in West Africa where ch the most chocolate production in the world happens and the biggest problem with child slavery, is, child slavery occurs. So he went to Burkina Faso, which is the country where a lot of slaves are recruited for Ivory Coast. And he found four former child slaves that had worked on cocoa plantations in the Ivory Coast. And he recorded their testimonies in a legal way, like deposed them. And then he actually um, brought one of the boys back to testify in, an, in the Netherlands. So as you're probably aware, court, law, all of that stuff moves at a snail's pace. So when he started this, it was 2002. So now he's looking at it again in 2004. Court case is still grinding wheels. And uh, he looked at ch the chocolate industry again and realized there was still no slave-free produced chocolate. So he contacted several chocolate companies to see if they were interested in producing bars that um, met that criteria, that if they were interested in producing bars in a different way. And they all said no. So that is when, in 2004, he decided it was time to make his own chocolate, his own chocolate, slave-free chocolate, to have that option on the market. Um, so that is actually where the name comes from. It's not Tony's Chocoloni, which is so nice, but it's Tony Chocolonely. And that lonely comes from, Tony is, um, Tun was hard for some English speakers to pronounce. So Tony is the anglicized version of his name and Chocolonely because he was the only one in the chocolate industry that was interested in producing chocolate this way. So he contacted a person that he knew in the Netherlands that had been working with Fairtrade. Um, I don't think they had, for that Fairtrade had been up and functioning for very long at the time. And so they contacted them and they bought their beans from Kuapa Coco, uh, which if you've been watching my videos, you've heard that um, Coco Cooperative come up before. So the Fairtrade people told them, yes, Tony, this is, we can, we can, this is slave-free chocolate. And so he said, okay, I'll buy the beans. He contacted a chocolate manufacturer and they produced 13,000 um, chocolate bars. But then when they got the bill from Barry Calbo, they looked at this bill and it listed the beans coming from all these different places, including Ivory Coast and Santo Domingo and all of these places, and he's like, what is going on? I cannot say that this is 100% slave-free chocolate, and that's my whole point of doing this whole thing. And so there was a bit of a panic. They were about to start selling them. They have this label on them that says 100% slave-free chocolate. So they started to call the fair trade people, and they started to, they actually went back to West Africa to talk to the, Coapa Coco Collective and see what was going on there. And they discovered that no, they couldn't say that their chocolate was 100% slave free. And that's when they had to change the label, this little orange yellow label here, from saying 100% slave free. But at the time it said towards making chocolate 100% slave free. Now it says together we make chocolate 100% slave free. So, it's complicated. <laughs> Beans coming out of Africa are complicated, to say the least. Um, so, uh, we get to 2005 now. 2005, he's got 13,000 chocolate bars on his hands. He's been doing this show, so the people in the Netherlands, are, they're aware of what's going on here. They know all about this. So, their plan was to take these bars and to sell them in a small store called Shakey's in the train station. They expected to sell a couple hundred on the first day, maybe. On the first day, they sold out of all 13,000 bars. There was lines around the corner to buy this chocolate. So there was obviously a market for this kind of impact company in the Netherlands. So they have since worked hard to change the industry and to 
basically a lot of it is just awareness of what is happening in the industry because most of us as we're eating our Hershey's or Twix or whatever don't know where your chocolate came from who's making it how it's being produced how it gets into your hands so what they discovered was that fair trade certification was not perfect as far as slavery went it was not perfect to certify that that was not happening they discovered that it was going to be harder than they thought to prove that their chocolate was slave free a lot of that had to do with the mixing of beans at the source and how beans are gathered and all kinds of things that happen in Africa. Um, a lot of politics thrown in there, a lot of multinationals involved. It is complicated. And so it's going to be, they realize this is going to be way harder than we thought. So that's when they changed their label. In 2006, they officially registered as a company. They hired a managing director, um, a woman. And um, at that point, actually over 2,000 people had now, chocolate consumers, had joined Tien's lawsuit against himself. <laughs> and so in, he, this was still moving to the courts. In 2007, the Dutch Attorney General dismissed the case for being out of jurisdiction, but acknowledged that the problem does exist. Okay, so let's stop there. There's a lot of stuff going on with Tony's Chocolate Lonely. Um, let's flip the camera around and we'll open one of his bars. I have, I have, I ordered them online. Um, I have a few different ones. So I have the milk, the 32% milk. Um, this is the dark, 42% dark milk, the 70% dark the milk chocolate hazelnut um, this is the milk chocolate almond sea salt and this is actually one of their best sellers the caramel sea salt and these bars are hefty bars they're way bigger than most craft bars most craft bars are, are somewhere around two ounces this is six over six so it's a big big bar all right so let's flip the camera around and we'll take a look and i'll tell you a little bit more about the company and the chocolate and some of the stuff about the wrappers so let's all right so let's talk about the wrapper so we've got the name tony is anglicized version of tune chocolate lonely because they're the only ones focusing their impact is going to be on slavery in the chocolate cocoa supply chain um, if you can see their little symbol there together we make 100% slave free so they've had to change that it was first 100% slave free, then it was toward 100% slave free and now they've changed it again so it is difficult to prove that chocolate in the cocoa supply chain coming out of West Africa is slave free so this is a 32% milk chocolate and they are they could easily get their beans from South America or Central America where it's a little bit easier to trace and to verify slave free chocolate but they do it out of West Africa because that's where the biggest problem is all right so let's take a look at the back here crazy about chocolate serious about people their vision is hundred percent slave free chocolate they say they're not a chocolate company but an impact company that makes chocolate and they want to make slave-free chocolate the norm for whole chocolate industry. So here's the ingredients. We have sugar, dry whole milk, cocoa butter, cocoa mass, and soy lecithin, which is an emulsifier, helps the chocolate move through the machines better. Um, let's see. So here, we're, these are the ingredients that uh, met fair trade standards. So Tony's actually pays 20% above fair trade standards because part of the problem with slavery is it's a poverty cycle it's of benefit to the multinational companies to keep the price low for commodity chocolate and that's part of the problem 
when you're in a poverty cycle, it's hard to get out of it. So this is made in Belgium. Um, I believe it's made by Barry Cabot right now. I could be wrong. Their um, justification for that is hoping that if they work with these companies, they can influence them to make the change. So it says, Psst, check inside the wrapper. So let's look inside the wrapper, see what else we have. Okay, so it just talks about right now how their slaves working in West Africa. They're working towards 100% free, slave-free chocolate. Um, they have online, you can join their email. They call you serious friends. Um, you can join their email and follow their story. And make no mistake, as a consumer, the choice that we make, the things that we choose to buy, makes a difference in what happens at the beginning of the supply chain. All right, so let's take a look at the chocolate. Like I said, this is a big, beefy bar. <laughs> You're getting a lot of chocolate with this bar. Okay, oops, I did that. That was me, <laughs> so not them. All right, so we have the 32% milk chocolate bar here. And there's some symbolism going on with the bar. So with the bar itself, and it's a nice looking bar, it's got just a, a few bubblies here and there, but it's got a nice shine to it. But here's the symbolism. You see how it's annoyingly uneven? <laughs> that's done on purpose it was divided unequally because the profits out of the chocolate industry are divided unequally and it's also got a little bit of symbolism from Africa so this bottom part represents the equator this is the Gulf of Guinea and if you go from left to right you hit Ivory Coast, Ghana, Togo, Benin, Nigeria, Cameroon. So this is the West African coast right here. So that's the symbolism going on in the bar. So it's a nice looking bar. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to break this in here a snap. Let's give it a try. Oof, I hit the camera. <laughs> Let's try again. Yeah, it doesn't have much of a snap. It's it's a milk bar. It's 32% milk, that's okay. Um, I don't expect it to have a huge amount of snap, but it does look like it's a well-tempered bar. Doesn't look like there's any problems. If you look at the grain, there's no bloom or anything on it anywhere. Um, but it is a big, thick bar. I mean, there's my thumb. Look how thick this bar is. Some, some, you, some craft chocolate makers are making four millimeter thick bars. This is way more than four millimeters. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to warm this up a little bit. Oh, I didn't tell you about, before I do that, in the Netherlands, color on the wrapper of chocolate means something. So um, when they did this, they didn't really realize that. They had a friend do the graphic design and he did it in like 10 minutes and they liked it because this was bold. But in the Netherlands, red means dark chocolate Blue means milk chocolate and green means hazelnut. So their bar is red and it's milk chocolate, which doesn't make sense. And they didn't realize they were doing that when they started, but they've kept it that way just for fun. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna warm this up a little bit. To be honest, I don't expect a lot of nuance coming out of here in the flavors or in the, in the aroma, but we'll, we'll give it the benefit of the doubt. So I'll warm it up a little bit, cocoa butter, has the same, um, it has a melting point near body temperature. So when you warm it up with your thumb, it releases the volatile acids. So we'll give it a smell and then taste it and see what we think. All right, so when I taste this, when I smell it, it smells like nice, rich fudge, creamy toffee. When I taste it, you get the fudginess of it. It's a little sweet for me because I'm used to eating dark, but if you compare it to, um, grocery store chocolate, candy bars, 
where all you taste is sugar and vanilla. That's not like this. You get it's sugar forward for sure, but you also get the you get the taste of chocolate in there. You get a nice caramel and a milkiness to it. So as far as milk chocolate bars go, it's a perfectly fine option. And the fact that you're supporting an impact company, then bravo, choose this over some other milk chocolate. I don't think I'm going to open any other bars today. Oh, I did want to tell you that they recently changed in 2012. So I guess not that recent, but 2012, they changed their wrapper so that they used uncoated recycled um, FSC certified paper. FSC is Forest Stewardship Council. So there's that as well. So they are trying to make an impact mostly on slavery, but in other ways as well. So I'm gonna flip the camera around and finish up. So fast forward, this all started in 2002. Well, actually earlier than that, but Tion van der Kuchen got involved in 2002 and the other two journalists, they got involved. Let's fast forward to nine, 10 years. We get to 2011, um, nothing's really happening. No one's putting a lot of effort into their commitment um, for the Harkin Ingram Angle protocol or any other chocolate manufacturer in the world to um, stop cocoa produced by child slave labor. It's a poverty trap that the business model of chocolate giants perpetuates. So in 2011 they decided they wanted to expand. They brought in Hank Jan Beltman who is a businessman. He came on as a majority shareholder um, to help with the company. These guys are journalists. They don't know anything about producing chocolate or running a company, so they brought him on to help with that. He's their chief chocolate officer. Uh, since 2013, their chocolate mass cocoa beans have been has been completely traceable. That means they know where it's coming from, they can document it, they can prove that, they can show that no child slave labor was involved. 2016, they did the same for their cocoa butter. Now, they're still finding child slave labor. I'll talk about that in a little bit, but they're working towards it in their part, doing their part. So um, in 2015, they expanded into the United States, particularly their launch point was Portland, Oregon. Uh, they launched with a special bar for Portland called Hello PDX Bar. In 2019, they launched into the UK 2017, 2019, 20, 2017, 18, 19, 20, even this year, was kind of a time of transition for them because they were scaling up and moving from a Dutch impact company to what they hope is an international impact company. So in 2019, they were um, determined to be the most sustainable brand in the Netherlands. They had the largest chocolate, they were the largest chocolate brand in the Netherlands. They had 20% share of the chocolate market. They also had 0% profit, um, but they say 0% profit, 100% impact, money is not their goal. Um, they also pay farmers 20% above the fair trade price, which equated to in 2019 to 2.6 million in premiums that go directly to the farmers. But like I said, in 2020, still working to solve the child slave labor problem. They've recently brought on some more minority investors to help with the global expansion. They are certified B Corp, certified fair trade. They are, they use GPS mapping to combat deforestation. They use the CLMRS system to trace illegal child slave labor and to work on remediation. That stands for child labor mitigation, I think, and remediation system. I think that's what it stands for. It's a way to trace illegal child slave labor. They still find it. I think they found over 1,000, 1,500, somewhere around there, child's, um, worst child slave labor situations and they take time to work with the farmers and work with the cooperatives to remediate these kids, to remove them from the situation. And to, um, it's more than just removing them. You have to remediate them. You have to 
give them a vocation where they can earn money and make a job. So it takes over six months to reme remediate a child from slave labor. So they're still actively working on that. They are actively working on moving toward the goal for the whole chocolate industry. Um, what else? You can go online and become their serious friend and get an email. There's lots of interesting things online about Tony's Chocolate Lonely. There is a movie about their creation, about the creation and how it worked on Amazon Prime called The Chocolate Case. It is in Dutch, but you can get English subtitles. It's very interesting. I think you should watch. And one of the things that um, they say that uh, to make you feel like you're not hopeless, because sometimes when you're taking on a giant thing like this, it can feel that way. They quote the Dalai Lama where he said, if you think something small can't make a difference, try sharing a room with a mosquito. And I think we can all relate to that. So I think that's all I have for Tony Um, Yeah. Uh, next week, we'll be doing another chocolate company. Don't know where they'll be from, but hopefully you'll subscribe and like this video and watch more and learn more about craft chocolate and the chocolate industry. Thanks for watching.